Ladies and gentlemen, live from New York and with hundreds of people online, uh, we would uh, like to start this uh, side event on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly to look at agroecology uh, and the right to food. Now, this uh, has been organized by the Transformative Partnership Platform on Agroecology together with the um, Swiss government uh, and uh, the Agroecology Coalition. And only yesterday, uh, the Secretary General was reminding us that we're nearing the point of no return, getting to a tipping point in terms of climate and the interrelated challenges of broken food systems, biodiversity loss, land and water degradation um, are, are all needing to be addressed by systemic responses, which is what agroecology um, um, is um, with the 13 principles um, that incorporate the 10 FAO elements uh, articulated in the Committee on Food, World Food Security high-level panel of experts report. So that's what we mean uh, by agroecology. And at UNFSS, um, um, a few months ago, uh, end of last year, the Agro Coalition was born as a result of member states asking for agroecology to be put on the agenda. Eventually it was in the pre-summit at the last minute in the sort of graveyard lunchtime slot. It was one of the best attended sessions and it led to the formation of the coalition. And the great thing about the coalition, which now has 40 countries, including three regional bodies, uh, ECOWAS, the European Union, and the African Union, and about 80 organizations. These are a coalition of the willing. And that's really important because if we look at how the recommendations in the HLPE report got watered down through the policy convergence process at CFS, you ended up with something um, uh, uh, rather less powerful uh, at the end of the day because everybody has to agree. So you go to the lowest common denominator. Here, we've got people who are willing to make agroecological transitions happen. Uh, and so we're hoping that they will blaze a trail and lead the way uh, that others uh, can follow. It's uh, governed by a, a, a group of people who are representative from across civil society, different countries in different regions, um, and different types of organizations, indigenous peoples, research organizations, so on and so forth. So somewhat different from the process within UNFSS itself. Okay, with that, I'd like to start our program and invite Olivier de Schutter, the uh, Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, who was previously the uh, Special Rapporteur uh, on the Right to Food, who's going to um, um, uh, open uh, and look at constraints to addressing the food crisis with insights from uh, the recent reports from both his own mandate and uh, Michael Fakhry's uh, right to food mandate. Olivier, please. When, uh... Many thanks to, to Fergus for his introduction and many thanks to you all for attending this event, uh, both online and and in live, we are in a world in which 821 million people are food insecure, in which 3.1 billion people have unhealthy diets um, to, to feed themselves. Uh, we are in a world in which biodiversity loss is extremely important with 1 million species at risk of extinction. And since 20 years, 100 million hectares of um, forests that have been lost, which is the equivalent of about twice the surface of France. We are also in a world in which greenhouse gas emissions, despite all the international summits and pledges, continue to rise. In 2021, greenhouse gas emissions increased by 6%, reaching a record 36.3 billion metric tons, an all-time high. We have, therefore, a food crisis. We have a poverty crisis. We have an ecological crisis. 
these are driven by conflicts, by climate disruptions, by the absence of social protection, magnified by the vulnerability of net food importing countries that have underinvested in producing food to meet, to meet the needs of their own local uh, communities. Agroecology increasingly is seen as one tool to address these crises. And indeed, agroecology has, first of all, the virtue of providing an answer to the important impact on food systems on both biodiversity loss and greenhouse gas emissions. Agroecology is a way to improve soil health, allowing soils to function as carbon sinks. It reduces the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers and thus associated greenhouse gas emissions. It enhances agrobiodiversity by relying on mixed cropping schemes and putting diversity and resilience above uniformity and increased volumes. It is therefore one response to the ecological crisis. It is also a response to the poverty crisis because agroecology is labor intensive. It therefore creates rural employment and in allows um, rural development as a result. It lowers the costs of producing food and makes farming affordable for low income farmers. And finally, it feeds local communities, making healthy food an affordable um, uh, item that they may have access to. For all these reasons, more and more governments and organizations recognize that we must move towards an agroecological transformation. This is true for the Agroecology Coalition mentioned by Fergus Sinclair, uh, bringing together 40 countries, the EU, the African Union, and um, ECOWAS, the uh, Economic Community of West African States, as well as 80 organizations worldwide. It is also the conclusion the high-level panel of experts of the Committee on World Food Security arrived at in the report that um, Fergus led on. And it is what many other processes have been acknowledging. The Alliance for Agroecology in West Africa, 3AO, launched in 2018 with the support of IPES Food. The Farm to Fork strategy of the EU launched in May 2020. AGRA just recently decided to rebrand itself to drop the green revolution uh, wording of its, of its name um, and to rename its flagship event that was the Green Revolution Forum into African Food Systems Forum, acknowledging the limitations of a classic green revolution-like approach. There is, in general, a growth of nature-based solutions to food systems, leading IPES Food today to present a report called Smoke and Mirror, released uh, to show the risks of co-optation of labels, regenerative agriculture, doubly green agriculture, nature-based solutions, and so on, emphasizing that agroecology presents a number of specificities that should not be ignored. It connects the social and environmental dimensions of sustainability. It addresses the whole food system and not only the production part. It is attentive to power imbalances. And finally, it draws from a plurality of knowledges, um, basing itself on um, the knowledge developed by the farmers themselves. Nevertheless, there are major obstacles to the agroecological transformation. And I would like to very briefly mention um, five of them, um, many of which have been identified by the special rapporteur on the right to food, Michael Fakhri in his report presented, presented tomorrow to the third committee of the General Assembly of the UN. The first obstacle is the public debt that many developing countries are facing. Today, the total debt of developing countries is 11 trillion US dollars. And in 2020, these countries spent 372 billion US dollars servicing debt. In 14 African countries, they spend more on servicing debt than they do on health, education, and social protection combined. Why is this important? It's important because it results in a situation in which these countries have to invest in export-led agriculture to have access to hard currencies in order to reimburse the debt. As a result, they cultivate what markets demand, and particularly high-value OECD markets, not what ecological logic would command. And that is one first, I believe, major obstacle to the dissemination of agroecology. Secondly, we still do not have a true accounting of food. 
the negative externalities from industrial farming are not reflected in the production costs. And conversely, the positive contribution of agroecology is not rewarded. We have grown a, a low cost food economy, but that low cost model um, comes at a high cost to the environment, to health, and to livelihood opportunities in rural areas that are not accounted for. The third obstacle is trade liberalization, particularly since 1995 and the entry into force of the agreement on agriculture within the WTO. The result has been to simulate a global competition between food producers, forcing them either to expand, to turn into large economic units controlling larger areas of land, or to exit from agriculture or to be relegated to subsistence agriculture in a form of self-exploitation. That is, I believe, a third obstacle to the agroecological transformation, this global competition that has been organized in the name of efficiency gains. The fourth obstacle is that we still measure progress in how we invest in agriculture by looking at the yields per hectare of one single main crop, rather than looking at the total output produced in mixed cropping schemes or resource efficiency or the contribution to livelihoods and to the preservation and enhancement of agrobiodiversity and of soil health. Fifth and finally, um, we should be attentive to the political economy considerations that may also um, indicate obstacles to the agroecological transformation. Um, IPES Food, together with BioVision and the, um, uh, the Institute for Development Studies, published in June 2020 a report called Money Flows, showing that only a small fraction of agricultural research funding goes to transformative solutions based on agroecology. In other terms, we do not support agroecology as much as it should, despite the positive contributions it makes. And governments supporting their farmers typically support them with packages that include seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides um, as a means to boost production in the short term and to buy loyalty of the farmers for the government in place. Knowledge intensive solutions do not allow to buy loyalty in the same way, and they are not. Um, um, the priority that many governments pursue. So these are some of the reasons why, despite the recognition by a growing number of governments, international organizations, and networks of the need to revert to agroecological solutions and to effectuate this transformation, we still are not succeeding uh, to follow this, um, this pathway. I look forward to our discussion, and I would like to thank you again for inviting me um, in, this, in this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Olivier. And um, you'll be coming back at the end to uh, give some uh, closing remarks. So um, uh, st uh, still more to come. I'd now like to move to uh, Jemima Anjuki, the Chief of Economic Empowerment uh, at UN Women, who's going to give us uh, a gender perspective um, in relation to these critical issues. Jemima. Thank you um, so much and for inviting me to participate in this side event. Um, the the Agroecology Coalition is one that I have followed extremely closely uh, because I am part of the Coalition on Making Food Systems Work for Women and Girls. And I see such a convergence between those two coalitions in terms of um, getting um, our food systems to where they need to be, um, to uh, a place where they are, they are just, they are equitable, where they do not leave anyone behind, and especially um, our smallholder producers. So thank you so much for, for, for having me here. Now, um, Olivier has talked about multiple multiple crises, and and it is really critical that we are having this conversation at a time when we are actually facing multiple um, multiple crises. And what we see from where we sit at UN Women is the dis disproportionate impact of this crisis on women and girls. Um, and we know even in times of peace, in times of, of, of no crisis, which we haven't seen uh, much of um, lately, um, that women and girls around the world are much more food insecure than the rest of the population. 
We've seen gender gaps in food insecurity growing over the last couple of years. In 2019, the gender gap in food insecurity was 1.7 percentage points. This has grown to four percentage points in 2021. What this means is around the world in 2021, we had 126 million more women that were hungry than men. Now, coupled with that is now a cost of living crisis that of course has been exacerbated by the war in, in Ukraine. And so that gap, is, has even grown further um, this year. Now, we also take an intersectional approach because not everybody experiences food insecurity in the same way. We are seeing much more acute um, food insecurity for older women, for indigenous women, for women in Africa, women of Africa uh, descent, we are seeing a more in gender diverse persons that be because of discrimination, don't always have the same access to opportunities as everyone else. But we are also seeing it more in persons with disabilities and those living in rural and remote areas. Basically our food producers are also the most hungry and we need to contend with that. But this is not just a crisis of food. It is not just a cost of living crisis. For women and girls, the crisis is actually driving so much more. It is driving gender-based violence. When households are food insecure, the likelihood of conflict increases. It is driving transactional sex for food and survival. It is driving sexual exploitation and trafficking. It is driving early and forced marriage. When households are forced into a corner, they will sell their girls for food. And this is a gross violation of human rights. It is endangering women and girls, both physical mental health, but also their dignity. But what we also see now is an increase in women and girls and paid care and domestic uh, workloads. They're being documented around the world. As climate change becomes worse, access to water, access to fuel wood that remains a big responsibility for women and girls, especially in rural areas. The amount of time women and girls are spending to do that is increasing. Now, one of the things that the Secretary General did last year was put together a global crisis response group. And you would have thought that when there is a global crisis response group, that women and girls would be at the center of those deliberations. And for some time, it wasn't. And so part of what we've done with the Global Crisis Response Group is do an analysis of the impacts of the crisis on women and girls. We have launched a report on that that synthesizes the available data and evidence and makes key recommendations. And the reason why I'm highlighting this is part of those key recommendations actually center on agroecology and what we need to do around agroecology. But most importantly, what the report highlights is that systemic gendered crisis like we see today, whether it's the ecological crisis that Olivier was talking about, whether it's the climate change crisis, the food crisis, the cost of living crisis, these are systemic gendered crisis and they require systemic gendered solutions. And while we have lauded uh, governments, international organizations, in terms of the short-term support that that's, uh, has to happen, we are also asking for more longer-term um, investments, including in 
farming systems, food systems um, that are gender responsive. So I will talk about five of the recommendations that, that are contained in, in, in this report. Can you do quickly? Yes, very, very quickly, very quickly. One is that we need to prioritize women and girls voice, agency, participation, and leadership. While they are affected, we also know they are major players. They are organizing communities around the world to make sure um, that, that our firming systems deliver. The second is to have more and, and better gender statistics and sex disaggregated data so that we can build the evidence base for gender responsive policy, planning, and reconstruction measures, but to also track gender-related impacts of food insecurity on women and girls. The third is the promotion and protection of the right to food, which is why, as UN Women, we really have been discussing with Michael Fakri, the special rapporteur, on how we can support the right to food of women and girls and other gender diverse groups. The fourth is accelerating the transformation towards more equitable, gender responsive, and sustainable food systems, including phasing out harmful fossil fuel as agricultural subsidies, investing in women's access to inputs, technologies, and markets, and strengthening local food systems and crop diversification to achieve not just food security, but better nutrition as well. And the last is to promote and implement gender responsive agroecological and climate resilient agricultural policies, practices, and programs. And I think that's where we have such an interface with the, with the agroecology um, coalition. We need to reduce the dependence on fossil fuel based fertilizers and other inputs, and particularly in the cost in the context of war affected shortages and the price. Uh, spikes that, that, that we see. And we really do start ready as we, UN Women to make sure that um, all these processes that we really are putting the needs and priorities of women and girls at the center. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jemima. And you've really pointed to the need for the coalitions to be working together. Um, and I think that helps countries actually to be able to know um, how to, to uh, interact. Um, let us move now to um, uh, Jahi Chapel, um, the incoming director of the Center of Regional Food Systems at Michigan State University, who joins us uh, online. Um, uh, one of the most erudite and uh, influential scholars uh, around uh, agroecology, um, who uh, always has uh, uh, an, uncom an uncompromising stance. Um, uh, Jahi, are you ready? I am. Um, thank you for that generous introduction and the uh, invitation to uh, join this esteemed group of colleagues. Uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the imperative to address inequality and in, in power in our food systems uh, and some alternatives that can help us uh, uh, effectively do that. Uh, the forthcoming interim report from the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food from, from Michael Fakhry is a, a really concise um, yet deep continuation of the Office of the Special Rapporteur's work, uh, pointing out the ways that our current food systems constrain uh, our ability to provide the right to food for everybody, uh, and the ways that agroecology and food sovereignty provide solutions coming from communities themselves and, and scholars around the world. One crucial item that uh, is pointed out by, by Fakhri in this uh, latest report uh, is the ongoing concentration in corporations who occupy so much of the space and power and control of our food, food and agricultural systems. And we really have to recognize the obstacles that this concentrated power represents and how they will continue to thwart the solutions coming from communities themselves, uh, solutions that we know are not just possible but necessary. Uh, so. There's a lot of, uh, of literature on the current concentration, including by my colleague, Bill Howard here at Michigan State. Um, so without going over all of that, we, we, we know that a small number of corporations occupy you know, supermarkets, uh, grain and seed uh, production, meat processing across various industries. And not only uh, does this cause problems in terms of uh, just basic justice and representation, but it's even from a classic economic viewpoint, inefficient. There's a lack of competition 
meaning that uh, you won't get the best results, much less the most just results from the market. Uh, it, it breeds injustice, uh, not just in terms of what in the United States, we've come to decide um, rather arbitrarily uh, over concentrated markets are, which means that there's a higher price to the consumers, but that's not the only way concentration damages uh, our environment and our people. Uh, there are lower wages to laborers, lower prices given to producers, to farmers and other primary producers, hollowing out of local communities, um, what we tend to call Main Street here in the United States, uh, and power really redirected to corporate boardrooms, which leads to uh, the kinds of decisions that uh, generate pandemics like COVID-19, as my, my friend and colleague Rob Wallace has pointed out in, in his work. Um, and we seem in many ways close to a point of no return. Uh, Olivier pointed out some of the that some of these around uh, environmental sustainability and, and food security, but also in terms of our democracy, you know, we have people or democracies. Um, uh, we have people who can't afford many basic goods. Hunger has gone up while productivity has continued to increase and uh, profits yet at the same time continue to uh, rise. Uh, we have a lack of trust, we have asymmetric inf information and a lack of participation. And so there's a real domination of the forums that are necessary to uh, consider and ratify the kind of binding treaty, for example, that Fakhri suggests to limit corporate power. Uh, corporations themselves are not going to agree to this and their influence uh, with many governments around the world is not going to allow for it. So uh, one thing that uh, my colleagues and I point to, including in our recent book, uh, Agricology Now, written with colleagues from Coventry University, uh, is how equity, uh, justice, participation are key parts of agroecology and food sovereignty and are necessary uh, if we want to provide the right to food for, uh, for everyone. And one of the areas that I like to point to is uh, the practices of deliberative democracy or deep democracy. And I really feel like we are, if we look at the situation in our political systems in many different countries around the world, uh, we're really at a turning point where I think fundamental change is needed, not just cosmetic change. We're at a turning point like the independence movements and revolutions uh, of the past several centuries. We need to go the next step beyond that, and that's empowering people directly. Um, there's examples like participatory budgeting um, originating from Brazil where people organize uh, starting at the community level, at your local street, and you organize and you vote on people to represent you at a citywide level coming from that group. And this differs from normal representative democracy in that uh, everyone is invited to this community organizing uh, event and you vote for someone who represents you, but it's someone you've worked with. It's someone who has caucused with you directly. It's not voting for someone who is running purely to get your vote. Um, and this is just one example of many where voices uh, enter into governance in a lot of different ways. There are food policy councils such as the defunct uh, Conseil of Brazil where you had one third um, government ministries, but two thirds civil society represented. Uh, you have citizens juries that have been used around the world. I'm most familiar with examples from India, United Kingdom and, and the United States. And for example, the Center for New Democratic Processes. Um, and you also have very importantly, this the uh, civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism of the United Nations and uh, or the, the World Food, uh, Food Council. And that mechanism as many people have explored is vital and needs not to just not be sidelined, but really uh, expanded and uh, uh, used as a, a center point for these conversations. Uh, I just think of with the recent UN uh, Food System Summit and all the controversy and contestation around that and the representation of corporations and to a lesser degree, uh, uh, scholars and others who would, I would say could be considered elites. Uh, instead of that whole space, it had been a space uh, building and organized with the civil society mechanism and indigenous peoples mechanism with other groups to bring in people from constituencies around the world, from farmers, from indigenous nations, from uh, peasants, fisher folk, uh, laborers, eaters. If they were representing themselves in a space like that, what would that have been like? If, if people in New York City were able to, in their communities and community organizations, show around farmers and laborers from other countries uh, to show them the food system in New York City and in uh, the, the farming system in New York and exchange their own solutions and ideas directly. Uh, I, I really think it, it could have been an amazing opportunity, one that would have been quite different and quite a lot of uh, uh, work. But imagine the kind of energy it would be if you knew whatever country you're coming from, you could be part of this international de delegation. 
you could represent your country and be someone lit listening and deciding in the best case on these binding treaties uh, that uh, Michael Bakri has called for. Uh, this, of course, can seem really uh, utopian, but uh, you know we have seen many examples around the world of these kinds of innovations, uh, including again in the civil society and indigenous people's mechanism. And I really think that without calling on the power and the knowledge of the populaces themselves in that kind of uh, mechanism, expanding on it, then we really aren't going to be able to address these problems because the people who are uh, have the votes in the marketplace in the powerful centers are those who already control over 50% of the wealth uh, and represent less than 12% of the people. And they are not gonna make the decisions that are necessary to lose profits, but improve the environment, improve the well-being, improve the right to food for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we have a, a, um, a, a space now for some, some questions. We've already got a, a lot coming in um, on uh, the internet. If anybody in the room uh, wishes to uh, make a question, please um, uh, raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring it to you. I, I have... Um, uh, questions for all of the panelists from the internet, starting with with um, uh, Olivier. You mentioned uh, loyalty um, uh, that uh, is 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 gained by governments providing uh, subsidies for inputs. Um, uh, that's one of the lock-ins that, that that you mentioned. Um, but uh, uh, what's asked here is: can't cash payments be made rather than input subsidies, so people can decide? Uh, what to invest in. And of course, those cash payments might be um, conditional on certain um, environmental uh, services or, or something like that. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Fergus, for this, uh, for relaying this question. Um, I think the main problem is that private goods are given priority above public goods in the way agricultural um, development is being supported and in the way farmers are supported. To a large extent, um, the um, support governments provide to farmers is used as a tool to, to buy their um, um, popularity and to influence the voters. Um, agroecology is about empowering farmers to design solutions themselves. It is about knowledge being transferred horizontally from farmers from farmer to farmer. It is about um, working with nature by being um, inventive in, in how to um, um, uh, how to produce with uh, a minimal use of external inputs. Um, in other terms, it is neither about um, pesticides, fertilizers, or seeds, um, nor is it just about money. And I think um, it is a different approach that requires from governments that they be modest, but that they organize this knowledge-intensive way of producing food by allowing farmers to organize themselves better. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad idea to provide cash to farmers. I'm just saying that if we want to promote the agroecological transformation, the key objective should be to um, disseminate this knowledge in ways that are very contextual, because agroecology is not about one single recipe developed in one laboratory or one ministry of agriculture, and then you know um, spread uniformly across large regions. It is about designing solutions that are local, and that are um, um, that make the best use of local resources. So it's a very different philosophy. It's a very different type of um, um, uh, policy that we need from from governments in order for agroecology to make progress. But I do think that um, in a very opportunistic way, when governments uh, receive subsidies from donors, when they want to buy loyalty from their constituencies they will be tempted to rely on the usual package of seeds, fertilizers, pesticides as a means to support farmers. And that, unfortunately, may boost production in the short term, but is not a long-term viable solution. Thank you so much. So that's all about co-creation of knowledge, the, one of the key principles in agroecology, and, and options by context 
approach where you're supporting local innovation rather than um, uh, sort of silver bullet type um, prognosis. Fantastic. Um, now, uh, Jemima, there is a, a question here from Helplami uh, Rumbai, and she says, Madam, your speech is very clear. The populace, uh, especially women and girls, have little or no knowledge about climate change in rural areas. How can this be improved? Um, thank you for the question. And, and I, I think I, I, I would like to actually flip, um, flip that because what I believe is that women and girls do know a lot about the impacts of climate change because they're dealing with those impacts on a day-to-day -day basis. When they have water shortages, when crops fail because rains have failed. If you go to the Horn of Africa today, all other regions that have drought, if you go to Asia where there is experiences of, of, um, of flooding, to Nigeria, women and girls are dealing with those impacts on a day-to-day -day basis. I think what the biggest challenge is is the information on how do they address? What are some of the adaptation mechanisms that actually work to um, cope with climate change? The second one is how can we make sure that climate financing is actually going to those that need it most? Because we are seeing those that are bearing the impact of climate change that is not where major investments are going. So we really have to, to, to flip that and say, it is not a lack of information on climate change by women and girls. We are having a system failure where those that are most impacted are not getting the resources to actually address those, um, address those impacts. And those resources could be in terms of knowledge of how to um, uh, adapt to climate change. It could be resources around uh, financing because once the technologies, the innovations are there, they need access to those innovations. There's already a lot of sharing amongst um, firmers that's, um, that's happening, but much more needs to be, um, much more needs to be done. Fantastic. And uh, Jahi, there's a question here um, uh, from an uh, anonymous participant. The facts and figures being highlighted right now are indeed critical and should be shared uh, to as wide a spectrum of stakeholders as possible. How are these being promoted globally? Have advocacy programs on agroecology been initiated? How is the political economy of agroecology making its way into the public discourse, education curricula, the academe? Jahi. All right, I'll try to answer that uh, concisely. Uh, but I mean, I, I think one important example is uh, this uh, meeting uh, and webinar right now, as well as uh, specifically the work that uh, Olivier did as Special Rapporteur for the Right to Food, as well as now um, uh, 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 Michael Pakri and um, unfortunately, I forget the, the name of uh, the um, Special Rapporteur between the two of them, um, but the, the work for, from the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on the right to food has been, I think, crucial in uh, expanding uh, the knowledge and discourse around this, especially within governmental circles and uh, to a large extent in academe as well. Uh, there's also, of course, the Agroecology Coalition um, that you know uh, has brought us together uh, today. Uh, there's the Center for Agroecology, Water, and Resilience at Coventry University, which is the first academic center of its kind. And there are the uh, movements around the world advocating for this uh, themselves, very notably Via Campesina and its many members uh, uh, throughout the world. Um, I think the main thing to remember is that even though this is a growing movement in terms of one of the measures of power and influence uh, uh, money, we still know that agroecology is getting a couple of percent uh, compared to the scale of funding and backing and to say nothing of advertising and education uh, that other uh, the, the conventional industrial sector is getting. And there's a growing space, I would say, of agroecology in uh, academe. 
um, but it's still, you know, arguably backwards, you know, uh, the way it, uh, industrial agriculture is the focus is sort of like if you were taught primarily about nutrition in terms of processed food and and uh, uh, junk food and fast food industries, and then the, the specialty side thing you could focus on was actual nutrition from fruits and vegetables. That's the way agroecology is often treated right now, but uh, there is a change and, and a change that is being pioneered by, by movements and by figures like uh, the attendees uh, we have here today. Thank you, uh, Jahi. And that brings us, as you mentioned, uh, La Via Campesina. Um, we want to swap now to get some perspectives from farmers, from civil society, uh, and from consumers. Um, and, and first up um, is Zainal Arafin Fuat uh, from uh, La Via Campesina. He's based in Indonesia. Zainal. Thank you very much, Sarah uh, Fergus. I am from Indonesian Christian Union. So in Bahasa, in, in Bahasa we call Selikat Petani Indonesia in uh, SPI. So we, uh, I'm also part of the Levy Campesina in promoting uh, agroecology in FAO. So uh, start in 2014, there is a symposium of agroecology uh, and then the symposium of say, uh, at uh, uh, regional level in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, and then on the second symposium uh, uh, of agroecology in 2017. Yeah, so FAO promoting the ten element of uh, agroecology as you meant, you also as uh, uh, you also uh, mentioned in the in the screen. So for for uh, La Fica Messina, so. Uh, we are glad to uh, uh, get a report from Michael Fahri, and uh, we also many many times uh, uh, discuss with uh, with him, especially in the report of trade. Yeah, so we get uh, giving input to uh, to him. So one is the uh, Michael Fahri is good uh, some uh, summarize the problem very well. So the lack of concerted action by government all over the globe. So I remember uh, speak of Michael Fakri in the CFS that uh, he, uh, he said that uh, there are two stories, one national government and world government doing nothing. That means the, the number of hunger people in 2005 and, and 2000, uh, 2021 is almost, almost, almost the same, 800. So there is a terrible problem in the food system. So I are uh, uh, concerned with the, uh, Mr. Oliver. We met in Geneva, Oliver Sikudar, about the political economy and also uh, a trade uh, liberalization. And then second, the, the exacerbated situation done by corporation in putting profits first before humanity. So they, they uh, get uh, uh, they use crisis to get profit. So this is more than in uh, 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 market factory. And then there's been a special report reference goes further by showing the fragility of our general uh, food system in this pandemic times, highlighting that pandemic has underlined the value of sharing and solidarity and the importance of the application of traditional local knowledge in time of extreme hardship. Community pursued when they were not uh, uh, ex ex uh, exclusively dependent on food value chain operation for the food security. Resilient solution included localized market, public food reserve and associated public food distribution system. Mutual assistance and the sharing of food as well as, as just transition to agroecology as mean for adapting to climate change. These are also some of our, uh, our main argument when we peasant and rural communi communities or all the, the globe campaign for the, uh, the establishment of UN drop uh, um, adopted in, in, uh, uh, in uh, United General Assembly uh, December 2018. 
So the end drop, of course, is based on the concept of food sovereignty, as also mentioned by Mr. Jai. And then uh, from decades ago, patients and people working in the area wanted their care for Mother Earth way of producing food, be recognized, practiced, and even promoted, uh, uh, promote, uh, promoted by government. We always demand the public policy, uh, policies that promote agroecology, food sovereignty, right to seed, right to biological diversity, and the right to clean and safe environment, among others. When we proposed the end drop decades ago, we are not talking only, uh, not only talking about ourselves, but we are thinking of Mother Earth, the planet, and our, our future generation. What we know, the Androp analytes too is that, is that patient needs support for sustainable agriculture production through rights, principle, and state obligation. Here comes the point where government needs to support agricultural practices of the people and government from all of, of the globe, of the all of the globe need to work hand in hand if we still want to see people and have a future generation life with dignity and with healthy nutrition food, for, ex uh, for example, government needs to support. Fin financial means to obtain what is necessary for agricultural food production like credit and insurance. States must take sure the women, in particular women, play a major part in food production, have equal access to land, financial services, such as agriculture credit and loans. The right to seek and develop information such as timely market information and the right to adequate training or to use the, the, that information and appropriate and affordable uh, technology. Although we are already protecting and conserving our land, water and territory through peasant ecology, and, and you end up provide us with the tool of demand that states commit to supporting our effort, development, agriculture, environment, trade, and investment policies and program need to align with transition to the sustainable mode of agricultural production as shown through agroecology. So I will give an example in Indonesia in my organization. We uh, uh, we we bought a product for our member during COVID, and then we give and also sell low price to the to the vulnerable people. So it also part our action uh, in during pandemic, and and also we uh, establish our food sovereignty areas. So that mean we we want to establish food sovereignty in in uh, in our in our territory. So this our 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 comment on the uh, report of the uh, uh, Michael Fakri, and and then uh, actually. Uh, Lafayette Campesina reject the Freedom Summit in terms of the uh, methodology and also uh, uh, involving many corporations that is also part of the pro of the problem, as mentioned by uh, uh, Jahi Kapel about this. So that's why we we want the we don't want um, uh, agriculture become uh, or based on the corporation. So that means uh, patient will uh, depend, on, uh, de uh, depend on again on the uh, bio, bio pesticide, uh, bio fertilizer, and also uh, uh, seed from, from industry. So even though it is a local seed. So this is a problem if agroecology uh, is uh, uh, dominated by corporation, not by us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think the fact that many civil society organizations uh, boycotted the UNFSS was part of the pressure together with member states asking for uh, agroecology to get onto the agenda it was that, that sort of pivotal uh, um, two pincered approach that actually resulted in some movement. And as Olivier mentioned, we can see that this, this movement is progressing. So let's hope that, that, that um, uh, it will continue to do so. And when better to, to shift to look at uh, a civil society perspective um, from Million Ballet, um, who um, is from the Alliance for Food Sovereignty uh, in Africa. Million. 
Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Fergus. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, thanks also for, for the speakers. Um, I think, uh, by the way, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is uh, the biggest uh, civil society network in Africa. Uh, we work uh, with more than 40 networks in Africa, uh, broad-based uh, networks, farmers, fisher folks, pastoralists, and so on. Um, we, are, we work also in 50 of the 55 African countries, so it's the biggest. Uh, we are explaining, uh, exploring the international processes, international uh, spaces. I'll come to the UNFSS uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, later, uh, but first, I think in terms of uh, exploring the transition to agroecology, we are exploring uh, different spaces. One is entrepreneurship, an area of entrepreneurship. Um, farmers should get um, income, obviously, um, and how can they produce agroecological products and uh, get income? How do we link farmers with con consumers. What kind of entrepreneurs do we need to, to help us in transition? So we have one program which we are doing with international actors uh, to explore the, this space. The second space that we are exploring in uh, transition to agroecology is a climate space. It's a very, very critical space, as you know. Um, there is a discussion around adaptation now. Adaptation is uh, one of the uh, agendas which are very high in COP and agriculture is also considered this year as one of the main agenda. So with a number of international actors, uh, including uh, IPS Food, we are exploring the policy space in the climate to promote uh, agroecology. Um, with uh, IPS Food also, we've started a program uh, which is called uh, Developing an African Food Policy. Um, yeah, we've, we've been working for the last few years on uh, African Union level and also in 27 African countries. Now we have started a campaign which is called My Food is African, a number of international organizations are joining this uh, movement. On seed arena also, uh, we are exploring the area of farmers managed system. Um, it's very, very much important because the international uh, corporate uh, actors are uh, trying to appropriate African seeds through laws, legislations, uh, and different frameworks. Uh, we are fighting on that space. So what is the importance of these uh, international processes, international spaces? I think one is uh, knowledge mobilization. Uh, we need to mobilize knowledge around agroecology. Even if the UNFS has a lot of criticisms uh, and deservedly, one thing that we have seen during this process is, is amount of knowledge which was mobilized uh, for and against the appropriation of, uh, of, uh, of the space uh, by, by the global actors, you know? So uh, it, it was a very, very important uh, space. Um, the agroecology uh, coalition creation, um, it would have been better if it didn't come out of that space, to be honest, from UNFSAs. That has given it uh, somehow a negative, uh, um, what do you call it? A negative uh, cover, uh, even though I know some of our doctors who are in there and also some of uh, the countries, including 14 countries is really fantastic, uh, but the process was, uh, was marred with controversy. So, uh, but you know, uh, UNFSS has resulted in this uh, agroecology coalition and we need to see how we can work together. Um, the collaboration, a lot of collaboratory efforts could come out from international processes. Uh, we are part of the TPP, which is very much important. As I said, also, we also collaborate uh, with, with IPS Food on, on the different spaces. Um, so, so this collaboration is very, very much important, international spaces. But um, uh, before I finish, I want to say a word of precaution. These spaces are very much important. International collaboration is very much important. 
but we need also, you know, um, as a civil society, as social movement, to strengthen ourselves. Otherwise, um, we can also perpetuate this power imbalance in international processes, wherever they are. Um, it's not only with corporations or corporate actors. This power imbalance is present. Uh, there are uh, power imbalances also when there are relationships created. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, otherwise, international processes are very, very much important for advocacy, for co collaboration, and for knowledge mobilization. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Million, and uh, uh, pointing to the polarization uh, um, that, that often exists in the debates around agroecology. I think it's, it's really significant. Um, and that exists as much uh, from the scientific end as it does from you know, the civil society end. It can often be really difficult to get things published um, in, in journals and so on because of um, um, uh, the way in which people are thinking about um, uh, agroecology. Um, but let's hope for more um, um, coming together um, um, uh, as we go on, uh, but without uh, compromising on key principles. Let's move now to a consumer perspective, and we're uh, delighted to welcome uh, a thought leader on youth food culture, um, an executive director of food for the Food for Climate League, Eve uh, Toropol. Eve. Thank you so much for including me in this conversation. I have been taking notes vigorously. Uh, and thank you for everyone who has taken their time to share their thoughts today. I'm going to be following up with probably each of you to learn more. Uh, my name is Eve Turo Paul. I'm the founder and executive director of an organization called Food for Climate League, and we're working to make climate smart eating the norm. My background is as an author and public speaker on millennial and Gen Z food trends. And the reason why I became so interested in food trends is because I can see how millennial money has shifted the marketplace. And today I'll be talking about the impact of consumer trends, really why, uh, and thank you also for including me in this conversation, but also why it is so important that we are considering how money is being spent in order to drive change uh, amongst companies, amongst politicians and beyond. And the question that was posed to me for this panel is, are food consumers shifting their preferences to more equitably and sustainably produced food? And my answer to that is yes and no. People care, but all too often they're not taking action. And this is not, uh, this is not really a fault of their own. It's really important to keep in mind that today the world is facing record high rates of anxiety, depression, loneliness, and stress. And most people People don't want to think about the apocalypse. They don't want to think about um, really difficult ideas while they're eating. Food is comfort and food is identity and food is celebration. And so we need to keep in mind that it's not that people don't care and it's not that they don't know. It's that this is a lot to be considering for people. Our minds as human beings didn't actually evolve to think about something as future focused and as intangible as the climate crisis. And so we need to be thinking strategically as those working within this space on how to frame this to the end eater so that we can be driving demand for agroecological foods uh, to shift consumer behavior to support a food system that is really going to be hopefully renewed. So all of us maintain core human needs. And if you look at uh, all different theories of human well-being, you'll see that there's really three pillars that philosophers, psychologists, neurobiologists align on, which is that each and every one of us has a need for a sense of control and safety in our lives. We have a, a desire for community and belonging, and we have a desire for purpose and meaning. But while we have so many people on this earth who are going hungry, who don't know where their next meal is coming from, who are dealing with record high rates of anxiety and stress, most people are not going to be making decisions based on their desire for purpose and meaning. They're going to be making decisions based on their desire for control, safety, community. Yet, when you look at most sustainable goods on the market, what are they telling people? They're saying, buy this because it's going to do something good for the world. 
do something altruistic, give up your meat, give up your straws, give up food that's packed with flavor that aligns with your cultural identity because the world needs you to do it. And that message is really only gonna work with about 1% of the human population right now. And so what the organization that I run does is we work to make sure that climate smart food culture is positioned in a way to be culturally relevant to the individuals who we're speaking to and that we're framing this in a way that is exciting and enticing. We have to make this popular. We know that food is the greatest lever to improving hum human and planetary health. But we also know that farmers can't make the changes that are required of them if there isn't a market to reward them. We know that businesses are not going to make these changes unless there is a market to reward them. I've also found it very interesting just looking through the Q&A questions coming through. There are a number of questions also about how to inspire new farmers. How are we going to inspire young people to become farmers who are utilizing agroecology if we're not making this cool? At the end of the day, this needs to be entering the cultural zeitgeist and becoming something that people aspire to. At Food for Climate League, we say that climate smart eating is plant forward, regenerative, and respectful of resources, meaning wasteless, that it celebrates diversity, improves human nutrition, connects community, and preserves our shared planet. And we work to connect the dots between sustainable food culture and people's unique needs, values, and cultures. We need to bring companies into this conversation, which has been mentioned by Jahi. Um, and the way that we, I think, need to be doing this is by reframing the conversation to say that a sustainable food, food future is made up of diverse ingredients and diverse cultures. And the beautiful thing is that food culture is already heading in this direction. Uh, the latest consumer reports here in the U.S. specifically is showing a rising demand, not just for plant-based foods, but for whole and less processed plant-based foods. Uh, there is a lot of energy right now around Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, these really unequitable uh, forms of highly processed, expensive plant-based foods. Uh, and the reality is that people are really hungry for more shelf-stable, more affordable, more culturally relevant foods like rice and beans, <laughs> tacos de nopales, things that simply meet them, again, where they are. There is also an interest in heritage foods, in indigenous crops, and there is an amazing food sovereignty movement here in the United States and in other places around the world. But this is not gaining the, the traction that it needs in the cultural zeitgeist. I was I'm just coming from a major conference of food leaders in the United States uh, and through Europe, talking about plant-based foods. Uh, there were not diverse voices that were being represented. I shared a fact with this audience that in the United States, African-Americans are three times more likely to be eating a plant-based diet than the average American. And I was met with mouths ajar <laughs> of corporate executives of food companies that have no idea that this is not something that's being pushed forward by white culture. Uh, this is a movement that is happening all around the world and that we need to be paying attention to communities on the ground of diverse backgrounds who really are the leaders of this movement. This can link into issues around food sovereignty. We simply need to be guiding the conversation in that direction. Education is simply not enough though. We can't just tell people what they do. We as human beings don't make food decisions based on information. Uh, and I think the, the movement around healthy foods can tell you that, right? You can have somebody tell you, you shouldn't be eating that cheeseburger. Uh, you know, you need to be losing weight. You, your heart really needs to, you to be changing your diet, but we need more than information to change our diet. Um, we don't make decisions out of uh, rational, <laughs> of rational thought when it comes to food. To drive the consumer cycle all around the world where foodie centers drive dollars, we have to acknowledge that we need to make agroecology not just an issue of justice and sustainability, but one of deliciousness, one of Instagram ability, one of cultural, of culinary exploration. And that really means that we need to meet people where they are. It's really hard as someone personally who's deeply passionate about this issue to sometimes take climate, take justice out of the conversation, but it's about really respecting the emotional capacity that people have today and continuing to make this way of eating fun, delicious and exciting to again, drive dollars that will then support farmers and reward the companies 
who are then supporting the farmers uh, to create this agroecological future. Most eaters just thank simply, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. I can no, thank you. That's, that, that's fantastic. And uh, I'm learning new words. Uh, Instagrammability <laughs> is a new one uh, uh, for me. So I'm going to need some advice from you um, to make sure that we are uh, um, uh, uh, meeting that, that requirement. Um, uh, uh, now I'm, I'm realizing I need to make sure I look up. Uh, are there any, uh, we, we've got another few questions um, before I'm going to um, uh, ask for some summing up um, from Switzerland and from uh, um, uh, Olivier. Um, uh, but we do have, we have two questions from, from the floor here. Um, hello. Yep, you're on. Uh, thank you so much for the panel members and uh, for those who were. Uh, please, on please that. let us know who you are. And I'm sorry, sure. said. <clears throat> I'm Harvey Garcia. I'm a senior evaluation specialist with UNDP. Formerly, I was working as an evaluation specialist for FAO in Rome. Um, so this uh, topic is really uh, close to my heart in terms of you know my profession. Um, thank you again for the panelists for a very enlightening discussion. Uh, just a quick question for Olivier. Um, you mentioned one of the challenges is political economy, and it, it has been repeated over and over in, in the discussions, in the presentations by other colleagues. Um, seemingly, this is a big factor, and when we evaluate uh, pro, uh, development projects on the ground, this is something we really consider when we want to understand the context of that situation. Um, and we all know that not all government would make the right choices, and these are based on their political economy too. How do you think the coalition would influence this political economy surrounding agroecology? Um, for Jemima too, thank you for your um, uh, intervention. Um, similar question in uh, the area of political economy. How do you see women and girls in organization working with women and girls affecting uh, the big hurdle of political economy in moving agroecology forward. And for Jahi, um, thank you for your intervention too. Um, I was wondering also, this is the same question I've been asking myself in Rome, can agroecology produce at scale? And um, what would be the bridge between, you know, what's happening now and that um, bright future of where everyone is doing agroecology? What would be that bridge uh, that you see and what can the private sector uh, be part of uh, in that uh, sort of like bridge? Thank you. Super, uh, Olivia, do you want to start? <clears throat> Great, many thanks for these very interesting questions. And I think to answer directly the, the question addressed uh, to me that the Agroecology Coalition can contribute significantly to make agroecology a part of a desirable future. Let me explain. I think one of the reasons why we are not uh, moving towards this transformation fast enough is because many governments still see modernization of agriculture as equivalent to its further industrialization. That is one of the reasons why governments spend so much in fossil fuel subsidies, for example, they believe this is the direction in which to go. And agroecology, unfortunately, sometimes even as a result of the vocabulary chosen by its promoters, is seen as something of the past, right? It's seen as traditional low input, tr uh, uh, low productivity agriculture, when actually it is the type of food production system that is based on 21st century science, much more resource efficient and much more. Um, aware of the planetary boundaries. Um, I believe the Agroecology Coalition can do a lot to make agroecology something, um, if not Instagrammable, at least something much desirable for governments who otherwise may confuse modernization of agriculture with um, uh, further dependencies on fossil fuel and, and further industrialization. Um, uh, let me just add one, um, one word to this, which is um, um, re reflecting on on what was what was uh, added by you in your question to um, to Jai Chapel. I think um, it is really important that in the fight for agroecology, 
we um, we we take into account the fact that consumers will not by themselves make uh, the transformation required, as I think quite rightly noted by um, Eve uh, Turopol. I think we need governments to take the lead, and we need governments to take the lead by being protected from undue corporate influence on their decision making. I will return to this later on if, if I can, but I think it's a really a key part of our discussion. Um, very quickly. So what, what we have been saying, and, and it's, it's something that's happened over the last couple of years, is, is this recognition of the links between gender inequality and, and food insecurity, right? That we see countries with high gender inequality are also more likely to be food insecure, right? And so over these last couple of years, we've had a lot of governments then talk about gender inequality in the context of food insecurity and agriculture transformation in ways that we, we didn't see um, many years ago. But what has then happened is it's, it's become this, this politically correct thing to say, right? And because the evidence is there. But what we then are not seeing is investments in addressing gender inequality. And so what I keep saying is it's not enough to, to recognize this connection. It is, we have to look at how then are we prioritizing investments in addressing gender inequalities. And to do that, we can't just look at government statements. So we, we were, I was at the UN Food System Summit leading the, the, the gender lever of, of change. And we sort of analyzed which are the member states that actually made some commitments towards addressing gender inequalities. But it, it is equally important that we look at where is the money going? Where are allocations being made in terms of prioritizing? So if we say gender inequality is driving food insecurity, and then the whole budget is around fertilizer subsidies and input sub subsidies and so on without any attention to how do we even make sure, at least at the minimum, that these inputs are reaching women smallholder farmers, and that's even just the basic without addressing issues, deeper issues around land tenure systems and, and women's access and ownership of, of, um, of land without addressing some of those structural issues that we know are driving inequalities in the, in the food system. Some of it is also just basic as leadership. How many times do we hear governments, even the corporates talk about, we need women's leadership. We just launched a report two weeks, about a week and a half ago, we call Global Food 5050, looking at women's leadership, but also policies and outcomes of food systems organizations. Out of the whole sample, only 2% of board seats in those organizations are held by women from low and middle income countries. So every time I hear people talk about gender inequality, gender equality, centering women, empowering women, it's good that these conversations are being had, but we really have to look at what is being prioritized, where are investments going, and really calling on people that this is not just a fashionable thing to be saying. We have to make the right, uh, the right in investments. Thank you, and that's obviously a really uh, significant point. Charles. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Charles McNeil. I'm with UNEP. I, I focus on forest and climate policy. Um, I've been really uh, intrigued, inspired, uh, uplifted by this event. I'm so glad to hear about this. I recall <clears throat> coalition. I, you've made such a compelling case for why this coalition can address simultaneously the issues of poverty, inequality, the crisis of biodiversity, uh, and climate and the, and the gender crisis, as well as uh, many other things. My, my question has to do with, and, and this broad coalition, I think is the way to deal with what have been sort of false dichotomies in the past between development or environment. These, these opposing 
issues which are inter interrelated, interlinked is so important. My question has to do with who else needs to be part of this coalition to, to crack this nut, to have this work? Are there sectors, are there organizations, are there others that we should be working to bring into this coalition to, to further uh, make it effective? But thank you so much. Every speaker was 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 very stimulating and, and important and interesting. So thank you for this event. Super. Can, can I ask Million to to um, have a go at, at um, uh, answering Charles's question first, and then maybe we'll take a few other uh, um, perspectives from from Jahi perhaps, and and, and then from the room. Um, Million, are you still with us? He just sent a message that he had to hop off because it was too late. Ah, sorry uh, about that. In that, in that case, uh, Jahi, can you, uh, uh, would you like to uh, uh, say anything on that? You're looking quizzical there, but uh, fr from what you were saying, uh, from the power um, uh, imbalance issues and so on, is a coalition, you know, of, 40 countries and, and, and 80 organizations, most of which are international. Is that an appropriate vehicle for addressing some of the key uh, um, you know, aspects that, that you were mentioning, or does it need to expand? I mean, it's, it's certainly an important start. Um, and uh, I would say that it is not, uh, I only have familiarity uh, so far with a lot of the people participating, not necessarily the Agriculture Coalition as, as a body before uh, recently, but um, it's not, it doesn't seem to be taking space away from autonomous movements that have organized, which are super important, you know, Via Capacina and its members, um, other organizations uh, around the world as well that support uh, agroecology and uh, peasant and indigenous rights. So, I mean, I think we, we need uh, a big tent, but a big tent that has uh, uh, the most prominent place for people's voices. Uh, one of the innovations from different participatory methods around the world sometimes has been uh, overrepresentation of groups that have less political power. So, you know, fine, have some corporations in their room, but have more organizations that are, are people's voices, have the government, but also have people from uh, citizens' movements and communities themselves and consumers' groups and farmers' groups. So uh, the coalition has a, a, an interesting mixture of groups, and I think that it's a, an important step in the right direction that builds on the efforts by others, including the civil society mechanism. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, all that, that's very important and great. And I, I think to the question earlier, um, I think if we are talking seriously about this, rather than the question of uh, where can private industry be included or how can, uh, they can, how can we bring them in, uh, if they're serious, they need to ask themselves uh, how they can contribute to these efforts and what they need to do and what they need to sacrifice. We're going to have to have, on, on the part of those who have much, some mutual sacrifice, and that's going to be called upon by their fellow citizens, and they can either uh, await for people to come with anger or they can join people uh, in, with genuine listening and willingness to really change and be limited in, or, in exchange for a system that might allow some profit, but allows much more sustainability and thriving. Thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, you're going to sum up in a moment, uh, Olivier, so I'm going to uh, hope that you can bring uh, um, uh, that in, in, into that. I want to move now to the concluding uh, part, um, and we're uh, very privileged to have uh, Marie-Law uh, Cretas Corridor, the lead of the Global Programme on Food Security in the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Marie Law, can you say something on international and national perspectives? Yes, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, I would like also to explain in a few words why we were very keen on co-hosting the, the side event and what is Switzerland's view on the different uh, topic we have discussed. And I guess it will answer some of the questions also in the chat. Uh, in the current context of overlapping crisis, Switzerland is convinced of the need to engage in food system transformation towards more sustainability, resilience, inclusivity, and locality. As recognized during the Food System Summit, this must apply to every step of the value chain, as well as to all elements that influence food system, such as biodiversity and climate, uh, governance and policy. 
furthering the transformation to sustainable food system in Switzerland and abroad is actually one of the main objective of our 2030 sustainable development strategy at home. So we've heard from the previous speaker that the alarming current food crisis is caused by a series of multiple interconnected and mutually aggravating sources. But I think it's quite clear that the root cause of hunger is not scarcity of food, but as we've heard now many times, uh, rather the power imbalances uh, all along the food system. Under this recognition, Switzerland has been supporting now for many years the Special Rapporteur uh, on the Right to Food team and work. Uh, the injustices and discrimination affect primarily uh, small-scale farmers, women and youth, peasants, indigenous people and pastoralists, but also vulnerable uh, urban and peri-urban consumers. Most of the time, these marginalized communities, as it was mentioned by Jahi uh, previously, they cannot contribute to the decision about food production or consumption, nor can they participate to policy processes sh shaping uh, their food systems. So we're convinced that one of the ways to empower individuals and communities is to use uh, the transformative elements of agroecology. Uh, Actually, indeed, it's an approach to provide people with more agency. Uh, this is a new essential dimension uh, to add to the definition of food security. And as we heard often, agroecology is at the same time a practice, a movement and a science. And we try to support the three approaches. And I think that was one of the questions in the chat. What kind of development partner do and uh, how can we address uh, agroecology? So first, uh, talking about the practice with our uh, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and uh, uh, our partners, we impl implement agroecological projects to diversify the food system and thus improve resilience. A project and activities contributing to a lot of different issues from diversification of seeds, of farming pr practices, but also of diets, uh, financial instruments, market access, and voices in the governance. One of our partners is AFSA, but since Million has uh, left already, I will not uh, enter into more details. Um, the second uh, option or way uh, to, to engage is the movement. So we've, we've been, uh, we have a long tradition actually of supporting civil society movement and contributing to their engagement in multi-stakeholder networks and platform. Uh, for, in, for, exa for example, sorry, in the current uh, program on human rights in food system, um, we support uh, local communities, uh, ensure that they are empowered to claim their right, and in particular women, uh, right to land, right to water in 14 countries. But at the same time, we work with duty bearers and capacitate them to protect, respect and fulfill these rights. We've been uh, strongly engaged at also at the global level within the Committee on World Food Security and also as an active member of the Agroecology Coalition. That's why also we're here today. And we'd like to add also a, a different approach, which has been a peer-to-peer -peer exchanges between policy um, makers. And uh, this has been very... Uh, successful so far. We started with uh, five countries, Uganda, Burkina Faso, Nepal, and Madagascar. But actually, we, we managed to engage more than uh, 30, uh, 350, sorry, policymakers from more than 80 countries. So where we were talking about knowledge and way to, uh, to increase uh, the co-creation, this is also a, an interesting way to, to go forward. Finally, the science, we, have, uh, we haven't mentioned that so much so far, but I think we are also very committed to, um, to uh, support the scientific, the scientific uh, uh, dimension and to get evidence and data from multiple sources to back up policy decision for this shift uh, in the food systems. So with other countries, we have pressed for the creation of a new program within the CGIR, and there is now a program dedicated to agroecology. We're very much looking forward to see the first results of that in order to demonstrate that agroecology, agroecology works. 
So as we look at the current situation, we might think actually that there are faster approaches to transform food system because uh, agroecology is probably not the quick fix solution. At the same time, uh, we, are, we, we have always advocated uh, to respond to crisis with a combination of short-term emergency and humanitarian support uh, together with a firm commitment to long-term development and perspectives. So in conclusion, if uh, as we look back, I think a lot has been achieved in the last uh, years. There is a, a successful implementation of agroecological practices across dozens of countries. And we, we see an increased positioning of agroecology in the global policy agenda. And as we look ahead, uh, we must recognize that the complexity of global challenges uh, which uh, no stakeholder can tackle alone, will require definitely uh, further collaboration. And uh, we call for solidarity with the international community and strengthening multilateral action. We are tonight in New York, but the, the link between New York, Rome and Geneva is very important. What is even more important is definitely the commitment uh, to support the most affected countries. And maybe a final word, very happy to have Eve with us and the youth constituency. And I think for Switzerland, uh, we welcome and definitely uh, support the role youth plays already in the transformation of food system. And we just uh, are back from the CFS 50 in Rome where policy recommendation uh, on the role of youth in the food system were approved. And I think Switzerland facilitated this process in a, in an inclusive manner, uh, uh, innovative as well, uh, trying to have in parallel to the formal negotiation, engaging use in different um, parallel processes. So we, we are convinced that um, these are essential requirements to foster a more diverse, equitable and sustainable food system. Thank you, Fergus, back to you. Thank you, Mary Law. And uh, uh, of course, Switzerland is the exception in the money flows report that Olivier mentioned in terms of having uh, a really strong track record of um, uh, investing in agroecology, um, in, in, in research uh, and, and, and the evidence base. Um, so it, it's really uh, great uh, to hear those priorities um, coming through. And the one CIG, one CJR agroecology initiative that that you mentioned is actually meeting um, uh, now in in Nairobi, having a pause and reflect workshop on its initial uh, workings. Um, so let me uh, uh, hand over the huge task of <laughs> bringing all this together in a pithy uh, um, statement, um, Olivier. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Fergus. And I think Marie-Laure Cretas' uh, words uh, recalling that agroecology is a social movement, a practice, a science, uh, really is a very good summary of the challenges ahead, but also of the very important progress made so far. I would like to, to thank Marie-Laure for those, um, those remarks, which I think are really important. I would like to conclude with maybe three remarks, one minute each at most. First, whereas there are many arguments in favor of agroecology that we have been rehearsing over the past 90 minutes, there is always one lurking doubt, can agroecology feed the world? And I think that question that um, our colleague from UNDP, formerly FAO did raise um, is, both extremely important and in the way it's formulated sometimes misleading. The purpose indeed should not be to feed the world, but for communities to feed themselves. And it's important to note that agroecology, a set of agronomic techniques, inter alia, including mixed cropping schemes, biological control, the use of leguminous plants to fertilize the soils, agroforestry, the capture of rainwater, etc. These techniques can significantly enhance productivity in regions where 
productivity of agriculture is very low because these techniques are not used. So in many developing country contexts, agroecology is a way to do things better and to increase productivity. In countries, regions, such as you know, uh, Europe, uh, Northern America, where, or, or many parts of Latin America, where, agri where agriculture is heavily industrialized, agroecology there is a way to maximize resource efficiency by producing better with less energy, um, with the more sound use of the scarce resources we have, and to create, um, uh, to create employment um, in rural areas to, uh, to, to stimulate rural development. So increased productivity is not the objective there. The objective there is to have a much more sustainable way of producing food and to have more diverse diets and to create rural development so that it is not only the objective to increase the amount of food produced. So I think your question, uh, dear colleague, calls for a nuanced answer depending on the pathways we have to follow to move towards agroecological solutions. But I think in different contexts, uh, it can be defended on different grounds. Secondly, we had a very important question raised by our colleague from UNEP, uh, uh, Chance, about um, uh, the alliances that should be built in the future. It's important to acknowledge that agroecology until now was primarily promoted by the Via Campesina and networks of small scale farmers, um, and by um, those who promote agroecology as a way to reduce the ecological footprint of how we produce food. But actually, many more alliances can be imagined with public health specialists, with um, development NGOs, with anti poverty groups, um, with um, uh, groups that, um, uh, that uh, work on. On, on climate change. In other terms, um, agroecology, because of its benefits at multiple levels, raises the possibility of having broad alliances formed beyond um, the usual um, division between constituencies that we, that we have. And I think uh, it is one of the reasons why it is such a, a broad movement, such so diverse in its composition. My third remark is that um, Zainal from the Via Campesina um, linked agroecology to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas, adopted by the UN General Assembly in December 2018, that also refers to food sovereignty. Now, food sovereignty is not only about um, giving priority to satisfying local communities' needs above the exigencies of global markets, it is also about food democracy. And food democracy was very much at the heart of what Jai Chappelle mentioned in his own intervention, referring to the need to challenge the concentration of power um, within certain major agri-food companies. And I do believe this is a key part of the fight for the agroecological transformation. One important provision um, of the draft legally binding instrument on business and human rights that is currently in discussion in the Human Rights Council is about avoiding corporations influencing the political agenda in a way that is disproportionate. In other terms, it's about avoiding companies that occupy a dominant position in the economy to translate this into disproportionate influence in the political system. I think this is extremely important. This is why the African food policy developed with the African Union by the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa um, uh, that uh, is represented here by Million Belay is so important. When we have the EU adopting a food policy, a food strategy, when we have a food policy developed in Canada, when we have in Africa for the continent a food policy developed, it means that governments claim um, the right and the duty to lead the transformation of food systems rather than leaving this to be dictated by the blind mechanisms of the market and by the influence of major corporations that dominate markets. And I think that is why there is a link between the agroecological transformation and the idea of food sovereignty as um, uh, one way to express the exigency of food, of food democracy. Food sovereignty is about the ability for governments and um, 
actors of food systems to reclaim control um, over the way food systems shall be developed. And I think it is um, extremely important that we uh, keep this in mind and that we do not allow the choices to be made in the future to depend only on, on what, the markets, um, what the markets demand. Um, in this regard, I think local governments have a major role to play. We have been promoting the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration that hundreds of local governments have adhered to until now. And I think uh, it is perhaps there also that we should be attentive, the need to rebuild territorial food systems, local food systems, in order to make um, the shift to agroecology possible. Many thanks indeed, and I look forward to the continuation of our conversation. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Olivier, for uh, summing things up so uh, pithily. Um, and your call for a broad and, and broader uh, coalition um, is really playing out. I noticed, for example, that it was the Ministry of Health in Ghana that joined the coalition, not the Ministry of Agriculture. So um, I think, uh, you know, uh, um, what you're saying uh, is being borne out. And, you know, this, you mentioned, you know, can agroecology feed the world? I think that was what you called a paper way back in 2011. Um, uh, uh, and what is really nice to see, um, and it was mentioned in Michael Fackrey's um, uh, report that'll, that'll go tomorrow, a paper in Nature um, by Chloe McLaren and her, her colleagues, showing across 30 trials in Africa and Europe, uh, 25,000 data points, all the trials are, are, are at least nine years long, that crop diversification with legumes added can uh, be more productive or, or substitute for um, uh, the use of industrially produced nitrogen fertilizers. So the, there really is a sea change going on in terms of the evidence um, that's available. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody um, who's participated. I think it was a really stimulating uh, event. Um, there are uh, 30 questions or so that have not been answered <laughs> on the internet, but we will follow up with panelists to make sure that uh, over the next few days, uh, we, we get answers to, to all of those. And there will be um, a, a lot of post-event um, material and promotion going out. Uh, so please look for that and continue to be engaged. If you're not already part of the coalition uh, or your institution isn't, then please uh, think about uh, uh, becoming part of it. Or if you're on the more knowledge and, and, uh, and implementation gap side, then get involved with the transformative partnership platform uh, on agroecology that has a community of practice um, um, that you can join individually. Thank you. And goodbye.